Good evening, everyone. So today I'd be discussing a slightly controversial topic that is myths and facts about post-exposure vaccination failure. So this has been in the news for quite some time, especially in Kerala. So I just thought I would uh, take, give my take on this particular topic. This, is, this was part of the talk I gave at the CalPedicon 2022. So coming to the topic, So rabies, post-exposure, prophylaxis failure, myths and facts. How I plan to cover would be, I'll be discussing a bit of quick look on pathophysiology and mechanism of post-exposure prophylaxis. And then we will touch upon the causes of failure and the finally solutions, a little bit of solutions too. So regarding vax rabies, we all know that once a dog or a cat or a rabid animal bites you, the virus first remains at the site of bite then it starts multiplying there. And then finally, through the neuromuscular junction, it enters the peripheral nerve. And from the peripheral nerve, it reaches the spinal cord and finally to the brain. From the brain, it again traverses downwards and reaches your eyes, your saliva, your tears. And remember that this transport of virus from the peripheral nerve to the spinal cord, to the brain, happens at a rate of two to four centimeters per day. Here, some important things that you need to remember is that the virus can persist at the site of bites for months to days to years. And once it enters the nerve, none of your post-exposure prophylaxis is going to act. So you have to act before it enters the nerve. Number three, we need to remember that the newer classification of um, wound category, in fact, classifies according to the depth of the bite. Remember, it does not categorize according to the site of the bite. Why is it so? Because your risk of getting rabies depends on how easy is for the virus to find a nerve. Because once it finds a nerve, it can definitely enter and cause the disease. So that is why whenever there is a lick, whenever there is a scratch, which does not cause a blood coming out, you're not uh, asked to take an immunoglobulin. But wherever the bite is, be it in your fingers, be it in your face, the most vulnerable areas, or be it in the less vulnerable areas like your leg, even there, if you have a bite or a scratch which has caused the blood to ooze, we need to take rabies immunoglobulin as well as the vaccine. So depth decides the class. But still you would find that more of vaccination failures are from fingers and face. That is because these are the areas which are greatly innovated so these are the areas where if the wound is of depth, then the chance of virus to find a nerve also increases. And the severity or the chance of you getting a rabies has nothing to do with the incubation period. Because people say that sometimes they say that, yes, you should be more careful when you have a bite on your face because the incubation period is short. Whether the incubation period is short or incubation period is long, the final end result is the same. So the incubation period, when you have it on the face, is short only because the virus needs to travel a shorter distance. The incubation period when you have a bite in the leg is long because the virus needs to travel a longer distance. So basically, that says about the pathophysiology. Now let us see what do we do as post-exposure prophylaxis failure. As I already said, that the virus can persist at the site of bite without producing any symptoms for days to weeks to months. And that is also one of the reasons why we say that however long the interval between the bite and the patient coming to you, you should offer vaccination according to the category of wound and do not bother about how late the patient has come because the virus can remain at the site of bite for a long period. The second we need to understand, we all know that the moment we give a vaccine, you don't get an antibody. The vaccine-induced antibody starts rising only by day seven and peaks only by day 14. And that is also the reason why after day seven, if the vaccination schedule has already been started and it is already seven days, then immunoglobulin is not recommended because by that time, your vaccine antibody would also already be there. And for that initial seven days, when the vaccine is yet to produce an antibody, you are giving the rabies immunoglobulin. 
Remember, rabies immunoglobulin half-life is three to four weeks. So if there is any virus that is persisting at the site of bite without being neutralized by the immunoglobulin, that and that slowly multiply sitting there, that will be taken care of by the vaccine antibody and not by the rabies immunoglobulin if the persistence is happening after four weeks. So that is exactly the reason why we also ask for a vaccine. Otherwise, we may think that washing will remove the 90% of virus and then giving the rabies immunoglobulin will neutralize the rest of the virus. Then why are we giving vaccine? The exact reason why you give a vaccine is because vaccine is going to give you a higher antibody titer. You can see how high it is here and also a more sustained antibody titer. And more importantly, in future exposures, the response from your body would be very, very quick. So after having understood all this, now you know that it's almost like a foolproof mechanism. You are giving a post-exposure prophylaxis. Then why does failure happen? Because it has been repeatedly reported in the media. And this last year in 2022, we have had around six cases of post-exposure vaccine failure in spite of receiving vaccine as well as immunoglobulin. Now let us see uh, where what, what are the problems that we can think of. Initially, People said that maybe it is because the vaccine is not being stored in the proper way. But we all know that vaccines are usually taken care of in a very stringent way. And we also need to know that unlike other virus vaccines like your polio vaccine or measles vaccine, rabies vaccine is relatively stable. It is not very thermolabile. At 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, it is stable for 360 days. Whereas even at uh, 25 degrees centigrade, that is most of your houses, most of your rooms, the temperature usually is around 25 degrees centigrade, it is stable for close to 10 days. And even at 37 degrees centigrade, it is close, um, the duration of potency is three days. So that means it is highly unlikely that the vaccine was thermo, uh, was had a thermal injury. So now comes the question, if the vaccine is of good quality, and we also know that the government had gone ahead and did a vaccine efficacy check, and it has Come, the results have come as positive that the vaccines are of good efficacy. So now the question comes, is it something wrong with the way it was administered? So we should know what is an invalid dose as far as rabies is considered. Yes, if an intramuscular rabies vaccine is given in the gluteal region, it is invalid because gluteal region has a lot of fat, but it has less of dendritic cells. So any vaccine that is recommended to be given in the intramuscular plane if given in the gluteal region is invalid, that applies to rabies also. But all our children, all our patients had received intradermal vaccination. So what is invalid in an intradermal vaccination? An intradermal vaccination, when you take the vaccine, you should have a wheel there. At the site of administration, there should be a puree orange. If that does not happen, that is an invalid because that means that the vaccine has become subcutaneous and vaccine in the subcutaneous plane, the amount of dendritic cells are far lesser than the amount of dendritic cells in the intradermal plane. And why you are using only such a small dose in the intradermal plane is mainly because you have too much dendritic cells in the intradermal plane and which directly takes these vaccine antigens to the regional lymph nodes. So that is why we are getting a good response with a very small dose. So now we know that this could have that intradermal vaccine is highly effective, but if it is sub Q, it is invalid. But now the question comes: so is it that all these patients, the vaccine was probably given sub Q? Looks highly unlikely. Why do I say so? I say so because remember, for intradermal vaccination, each day you are giving two doses of the vaccine. Each visit, it is two site vaccination. So highly unlikely that both the site it is becoming invalid. Another thing we need to remember that the WHO has recommended the intradermal vaccination schedule way back in 1992. And it still sticks on to that. It has not retracted from that. Similarly, the first intradermal anti-rabies clinic in North India was started way back in 2008. And it's almost at the same time that Kerala also ad adopted the intradermal schedule. And since then, so many years have passed and we have not had an increase in post-exposure vaccination failures. And in, and in fact, after introduction of the intradermal schedule, in places uh, in, uh, where it was a payable vaccine, they have found that the poor patient seeking vaccination has increased by threefold. 
So intradermal vaccination has not been a failure story. In fact, it has been a success story so far. So now what happened? What is happening? Now, if you look closely into the six cases of post-exposure prophylaxis failure that happened in Kerala, you would realize that almost all of them had multiple bites and all of them had bites either both in the face and the hands or either way. Usually it is multiple bites. And most interestingly, if you note, you will realize that they have come with the first symptom by day 14. So we already said, when you give a vaccine, the vaccine antibody is expected to peak by day 14. So here at a time when the vaccine antibody is expected to peak, the patient has already manifested the disease. The virus has already reached the brain. So the virus would have reached the uh, nerve long back. That means this cannot be a vaccination failure because the disease is manifesting even before the vaccine is supposed to produce the antibody. So then what is the problem? If you look at data from other countries, this is the CDC data of 21 cases of post-exposure prophylaxis failure. Here also you can see the same phenomenon. Majority of the death is happening within 30 days of the bite. So that means in majority of post-exposure vaccination failure, it is in fact the them, at least in many of them, the cause may be direct inoculation of the virus into the vax, into the nerve or to very close proximity to the nerve because of which the post-exposure prophylaxis failure is happening. But then the question comes, we didn't see much before. Why are we seeing now more? We need to know that in India, the frequency of animal bite is one every two seconds and that of death is one in 30 minutes. That's a huge number. So where does Kerala stand? What is the news from Kerala? We should know in the 2022, in Kerala, more than 2 lakh dog bites have reported and they have been offered post-exposure prophylaxis. And also another 2.5 lakh cat exposures have also received post-exposure prophylaxis. So close to 4.5 to 5 lakh suspected rabies exposures where Many times the bite has been on the face and the hand, but none of them have, have expected, have experienced a post-exposure prophylaxis failure, except the three, six cases that we discussed before. And we also should note that there has never been a clustering. It has never come that in a particular clinic, two people had received the vaccine and both succumbed, or a particular dog had bitten five people and all the five have succumbed. We have never had clustering, which again shows that the quality of vaccine, the quality of immunoglobulin, the quality of inoculation does not seem to be a cause. Most probably it could be because whenever the denominator goes up, the denominator so high, the numerator of post-exposure vaccine failure also has the risk of increasing. So does that mean that we don't have any other further prevention strategies? Can we also do something to avoid even these six deaths? Yes, we should try to vaccinate pets as well as stray dogs as much as possible. Because if the rabies reservoir in the dogs come down, in the animals come down, naturally the incidence of rabies in humans would come down. So that is important because WHO is aiming at a zero death due to dog bite by 2030. So one of the strategies is definitely vaccinating dogs and pets. The next is pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, when you say vaccinate animals, remember just because you have vaccinated the pet does not mean that whenever you have a bite, you should not take a post-exposure prophylaxis because a an animal is considered as vaccinated only if the current age is more than one year. If the first dose of vaccine was given at age more than three months and the animal has received two doses six months apart and is also receiving yearly vaccination and the vaccine is of good quality. It is very difficult to ensure each and every point in this. And that is also the reason that even if the dog or, or cat, your pet is vaccinated, still if you have an exposure, you should take a post-exposure prophylaxis. So now what exactly is this pre-exposure prophylaxis? Pre-exposure prophylaxis is a single dose on 0, 7 and day 28. WHO in fact is now recommending only two doses on 0, 7, but Indian government still recommends three doses, 0, 7 and 28. 
Remember, anyone who has taken at least three previous doses of rabies vaccine is considered as vaccinated with rabies. They vaccinated with uh, rabies vaccine. Now, what happens when you take a pre-exposure prophylaxis? When you take a pre-exposure prophylaxis, after you have taken two or three doses, you definitely have an antibody titer, which is much, much above the protective level. But after six months, in many people, the antibody level is going to come below the protective level. So if by six months itself, in some, the antibody levels are going to come below the protective level, then why are we taking the pre-exposure prophylaxis? Because when you have previously taken at least three doses of rabies vaccine, you have a re-exposure and you take a vaccine, there is no lag period. There is an immediate jump in antibody titer and this antibody titer is far higher than the previous one. So this is exactly the reason why you are taking a pre-exposure prophylaxis. I'm again explaining, when you're giving a vaccine, the first dose produces a group of memory cells and a group of antibody producing plasma cells. The second dose will give you a higher number of memory cells and a higher number of plasma cells. Plasma cells are the ones that produce the antibodies that die off, but your memory cells will persist. And what do these memory cells do? Normally, these memory cells are simply moving around, doing nothing, producing no antibody. But when a vaccine is given, immediately the memory cell identifies the vaccine, converts itself into a plasma cell and start producing a lot of antibodies, which gives you immediate protection. So the aim of pre-exposure prophylaxis is in fact to have a good reserve of memory cells, which can respond to any future boosters. So that is the exact reason why we want to take a pre-exposure. Remember, when you take a pre-exposure prophylaxis, you don't require a rabies immunoglobulin in future bites. So nobody is going to poke the wound if you have an injury. The next is soon after a pre-exposure prophylaxis for the next three months, you do not require any further vaccination. And any time you have a re-exposure after three months, all you need is just two doses, day zero and day three. No rabies immunoglobulin, no four or five doses. So that is the main advantage of pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, how long does this pre-exposure prophylaxis help you? WHO says that this is going to help you lifelong, at least for 10 years, definitely. Because studies are there that even at 10 years, when you give a booster, immediately you get an anamnestic response. And most important message is there has been no vaccination post-exposure failure in patients who had previously received a pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that is the most important. So we have discussed post-exposure vaccination failures, but post-exposure failure has not been reported in individual who have a history of receiving a pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that is the main uh, message that I want to give today. So remember, there are multiple causes of post-exposure vaccination failure. Some of them definitely are correctable and some of them are modified.